talk is entitled Walter P. Schuhart and the Philosophy of Software. It was prepared for the History and Philosophy of Computing Conference at Turin, Italy. But before I get into the talk, I want to give you a sense of the kind of philosophy it's going to entail. I'm not a philosopher. At best, I have been called a historian of ideas, which is a lovely title and does suggest some distant relation to philosophy. But at base, I come from the technical community. My degrees are in mathematics, statistics, I was raised in a technical household where I had great access to computers, and I've been a leader of one of the professional societies of computation, the IEEE Computer Society. I mention this because though I've read the literature of philosophy and software, I'm not going to be addressing it quite the way that they are talking about philosophy and software. At the moment, that literature deals with language, with meaning, with thought, and with other aspects that are very interesting, but are not what I'm treating in this talk. In this talk, I'm looking at how software became material, became a material artifact. It is really nothing more than data, instructions, a way of commanding a machine to do something. Yet over the course of its history, it has become material. And Walter P. Schuhart, who is an engineer who thinks deeply and quite philosophically about issues and reads a very serious philosophical literature, had much to contribute to it. But that's getting ahead of our story. And so, let us begin. The central character in our story is going to be Walter Schuhart, who is neither a software designer nor a philosopher. He was a production engineer. Yet, he was widely read in philosophy. He read Dewey, he read Bertrand Russell, he read C.I. Lewis. Since he is before the common era of software, he was not interested in it, but in production, in the process of producing goods and he wanted to know what kind of entity was it, and how could he use modern ideas to come to grips with it. Now, the connection of Schuhart's ideas to software comes when software developers start being concerned about production and producing high-quality software. Through the first 20 or so years of the computing era, there was a perception that software was error-prone, that it was difficult to produce, that it was always late, always delivered slowly. The key event that really starts to bring these ideas into focus and begins to attract people to work on them is the NATO Garmisch Conference in 1968. It was a conference that dealt primarily with the problems of creating quality software. At this point in computing history, software consists either of tools produced by the industry or bespoke software produced by users. There is no software industry. There is no process of amortizing the development costs of software over many different customers or firms. At the Garmisch conference, the participants talked freely about how do you engineer software. This conversation represented a substantial shift for many of the participants who often came from electrical engineering because it fundamentally switched the role of engineered object and signal. In electrical engineering, you don't actually engineer electricity. You engineer a machine to control electricity. If we want to generalize the concept, you're creating a machine to control a signal. You're engineering the machine. In software engineering, you're engineering the signal rather than the machine, and the machine is fixed. There continues to be in the computing literature, particularly in certain parts of the IEEE literature, a reluctance to think that we engineer software. I can point to a number of articles in the IEEE library, all of them published fairly recently, in which the authors claim that software engineering has it backwards, and if they only did it right, then we could really engineer software. That's the aspect of the materialization of software engineering. Computer engineering engineers the machine. 
Now, why was the process of software engineering started only in 1968, some 22 years after the start of the commonly accepted modern computer age? There are a number of historians that argue about issues of software crises and things coming to a head in that period, and there is some truth to it. The IBM 360 computer series moved very quickly into a large number of businesses and created a tremendous demand for software that could not be met by the existing infrastructure. But there's a second reason as well. Prior to 68, and even after 68 for a time, software was quasi-material. It existed as punched cards, as tape, and as other physical forms, and for much of its history had been considered unworthy of being engineered. One of the measures of that, obviously, is that the original programmers, the ones that worked on SAGE, the ones that worked on the ENIAC, and on the early special machines of the 1960s, were recruited from a variety of disciplines. They looked to mathematicians, to logic, to musicians, and because they had difficulty filling all the slots, they opened the doors to women. And indeed, you see memoirs in the literature of a surprisingly large number of women who programmed in the 1950s and early 60s. Programming itself dematerialized slowly. Secondary storage, electromagnetic disks, which were such an important part of developing programming and in storing programs, began in 1957 with IBM's RAMIC. Time-sharing systems, which advanced it, began with MCP, CTSS, Multics, around 1961, but they really didn't become popular until 1968 with the PDP line, as that moved increasingly into small businesses and into university departments. Now, the materialization of software involves a connection between software and the ideas of production. In fact, those two ideas began very much together and separated and were rejoined in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. The idea of a production plan for intellectual work, for calculation, can be dated to 1793 with Auguste de Prone. He used the term plan, which became the common term for describing how calculations should be done and then how factories should be organized and operated. He talked about the plan general de execution for his programming teams. Those plans resemble what we would now call a program for a computer. De Prona used it for a staff of computing people. The term was transferred to industrial engineering during the 19th century. Babbage certainly was one of the people who helped transfer it, as he designed both computing machinery and wrote an extensive book about the use of machinery in manufacturing. Planning at some level was always considered a fairly high-level task. Someone would plan what the factory would do and then give instructions to a supervisor or a foreman who would do the actual work of identifying the specific steps of the manufacturing process and getting the workers to do those steps. In the 1950s, we see this division in programming. Much of the literature through 56 and 57 makes a clear division between planning, by which they are talking about doing the mathematics or algorithmic design for a program, and coding, which is producing the actual program itself. During the 1950s, the early program developers did not necessarily see this connection, or certainly they rarely articulated it. Software broke with its origins in electrical engineering and mathematics largely during the SAGE project, which lasted from basically 1954 to 1959. It was a large-scale project that involved an outside firm that did all the coding, but by the end of that time, they were calling it programming. It clearly became identified as something quite different from electrical engineering or mathematics during the creation of OS 360, the first operating system for the IBM System 360s. This was created by Frederick P. Brooks, who has written extensively about his experience with the IBM 360, his classic book, The Mythical Man Month, 
summarizes the lessons that he learned during that period. He made it very clear that his primary lesson was that software was something different than electrical circuitry. Software was something different from mathematics. It needed a certain kind of structure to build and a certain kind of process. As has become common and has been reiterated by other software engineers and architects, he argued that software needed to be created by a small, highly disciplined team led by a single leader who took responsibility for all. By 1968, we can find five major themes, five sets of ideas for approaching software. Some were in the literature before Garmisch, many were discussed at the Garmisch conference, and at least one appeared shortly thereafter. Those five treatment strategies include, first, the idea of treating software as you would treat a mechanical device, thinking of it as a machine and engineering it as a machine. McElroy is responsible for articulating that idea in 1968, and he was one of the participants at Garmisch. The next came out of the mathematical community and wanted to consider software as an axiomatic process. Tony Harare became one of the major persons articulating it. Next, there was the idea that programming was a form of structured communications. That had been forming before 1968 and was one of the main topics of discussion at the Garmisch Conference. That approach was pioneered by Edsger Dijkstra and was promoted by him. Shortly after Garmisch came the idea that software was a natural entity and needed to be treated as we treat objects in nature. That's due to Halstead. Finally, the last version was that software was part of a production plan and hence needed to be treated with the same tools that we use to treat production plans. That's due to Barry Bohm. Now, all five of these approaches remain part of software engineering and software development as a whole, although some are more important than others. Schuhart's approach, which is also Barry Bohm's approach, is really the core element of software engineering. And the piece that it brings that the other pieces did not was a materialism, a materialism of software that allowed its practitioners to measure it, to quantify it, and to qualify it. Now, the idea that you could treat software as a machine and engineer it like a machine goes back to a mechanical machine itself. You can date it very clearly to 1938 and the Harvard Mark I. From the work done on the Mark I, people began to think that software was part of the machine that you could break it up into smaller elements and use those assemblies as the whole. In particular, the concept of a subroutine, and indeed the concept of a loop, come from this project. The loop was a loop of paper tape, and one of the ways that the Mark I worked was to have a string of paper tapes and could transfer control from tape to tape. The advocates of treating software as a machine argued that we really needed to produce a software component industry, people that would create the equivalents of gears and bearings and axle rods and other little devices that would be assembled as the whole. McElroy, in particular, argued for this and in his later years became somewhat sad that this had never developed as he envisioned it. Yet, at some level, those very elements survive in the modern concept of the library. The mathematical library, the set of common routines that computed difficult mathematical functions, can be traced to the early 1960s. It really came out of two sources. The first source was the National Bureau of Standards. In 1964, it published a book called Higher Mathematical Functions by Abramovitz and Stegen. It was actually the work of a collection of human computers, people who did calculation by hand during the 1940s and 50s. It can be viewed in many ways as their last and great triumphant contribution. At the same time, the ACM started publishing collected algorithms for those very functions. 
This process continued throughout the 60s, advancing into other fields, but it really became more ordered and more structured during the 70s, when several of the national labs undertook to design systematic, organized, carefully constructed, and proven laboratories of mathematical functions. The languages that came out of the 80s, of course, began to build on this and use libraries for a variety of things, including basic input and output, and perhaps most effectively, graphics, which also began to expand in the 1970s and became a major tool in the 1980s. Now, this approach became a minor part of the way we approach software because it had a number of shortcomings. The first was it was not sufficient to produce quality software. You needed other things to build a strong, firm foundation for good software systems. Second, it was too close in many ways to mere analysis, to merely taking the problem apart and breaking it into teeny pieces without thinking about how all those pieces assembled into a system. And it really was a mismatch with the material model. There was nothing in it that allowed you to somehow come to grips with the limitations of a software system or how you might measure and compare that system and determine that it was a quality system. The axiomatic approach to software development comes out of mathematics. The idea is that programs are merely the process of reasoning from fixed assumptions. You can find a number of people who contributed to the foundation of this idea. Probably most prominently is David Hilbert, who at the start of the 20th century tried to put mathematics on that same kind of footing. Alan Turing and Alonzo Church both contributed to these ideas. The early artificial intelligence researchers of the 1950s also embraced this idea as they worked to produce computer programs that could prove theorems. Algol 60, that highly influential language from the first generation of computer languages, relied on formal definitions and also viewed itself as having an axiomatic foundation. There is, in the computing literature during the 1960s, a concept known as an Algol lawyer, where people argue with each other about the nature of the syntax of a language and the semantics underlying that syntax. However, the basic ideas of axiomatic programming are generally attributed to C.A.R. Harari in his 1989 paper. He argued that computer programming was an exact science and needed to be treated as such. And if it were an exact science, then programs could be proven true or false. Hence, the way to develop good programs would be to start with a fundamental set of axioms reason forward from those axioms using the program, and thereby be able to know exactly what you are doing, exactly what the program did, and exactly that the program did it as you intended. This approach to programming and software development remains popular, certainly among academics, and has a number of surviving elements that shape and modify and influence the software development computing. This book here, David Grees, The Science of Computer Programming, is a 1990 book that remains influential in the academic community. And there are several surviving elements in software engineering, specification languages, for example. The idea that people need to specify what programs are to do very carefully and very completely. Formal definitions are another and the academic community still publishes articles on proof of correctness and how you develop properly structured, properly reasoned, provably true computer programs. The shortcomings of this approach are evident to anyone who has dealt with any software system of any complexity. The economics are very, very bad. Once you start building a real system, a system that has any number of decision points in it, you quickly find that the number of paths through the software is extraordinarily large, far too large for anyone to reason humanly through all the paths and prove the correctness. Because of that challenge alone, this form of programming 
has limited influence on software engineering and development today. Some of it has been incorporated in terms of mechanical support for checking and proving true all the different paths through a computer program. But that sense of mechanical checking has the same problem that is true at any form of mechanical logic, the stopping program. You never know if your machine has merely failed to find a correct answer or if it's looking and will never ever stop. The axiomatic programming approach has never really provided any form of materialization at all. If anything, it's pushed it in a different way, in a more abstract way, in a way of treating computing program not as something to be measured, but as something to be tested, tested against axioms. The structured communication approach to software, or as it quickly became known, structured programming, came from Edsger Dijkstra, in the Netherlands. It posited that programming was a communication between the programmer and the machine, and hence you needed to discipline the programmer. You needed to get the programmer to produce instructions, ideas, programs in a form that was easy to understand, easy to prove, easier for the machine to use. He argued its value largely on reduced complexity, although he did make the case that it should produce fewer errors, it should be easier to validate and verify your software. The system that he used to demonstrate the technique was THE operating system, one that he created. It was very small, very compact, and done with a very small number of programmers. It was well documented and highly influential. However, the one article that really brought him to the general attention of software developers was a letter to the editor he wrote in the communications of the ACM called Go To Considered Harmful. In it, he argued that programmers use the go to, the uncontrolled movement of program control, without thinking about the structure of the code, without thinking of the kind of document it presented to other programmers and to the machine itself. That article has both spawned a great deal of comment and criticism, although if you go back and look at it today, the criticism tends to be fairly supportive and have a yes but aspect to it. Most of the criticism has been addressed by higher level control structures in languages. It's also produced a large number of spin-offs, sometimes even parodies of people who identify some problem in computing and start their article, this aspect considered harmful. Structured programming remains a highly influential aspect of software development. Although it's largely been subsumed in software development and you really don't see the remnants of it unless you go looking for it. One of the key things is software architecture, how you organize and structure large systems. That draws heavily from Dijkstra's work and clearly builds upon it. The programming tools, those that format code and structure it and make it easy to read, clearly draw their ideas from Dijkstra and his followers. The shortcomings of his method were obvious to the people around him at the time. You don't need to do programs this way in order to produce good code. You can do so in other ways and in some cases tightly coded things that do not follow a structured form are faster and better. It clarified structure, but it didn't always clarify meaning. That was a point that his critics regularly made, that the structure might be good, but the structure might not correspond with how people understood the problem. Finally, as we moved into the 1970s with the rise of software engineering, Critics argued that this was materializing the wrong thing, that while you could measure how a program deviated from a well-structured program, how you could quantify how a badly structured program failed to meet a certain set of standards, that wasn't the quantification that anyone really wanted. They wanted software that performed well, not necessarily software that looked good. The movement that considered software to be a natural entity, 
an entity that existed in its own ecosystem and needed to be measured against that ecosystem, comes slightly after Garmisch. It was called Software Science, and its founder is generally identified as Maurice Halstead. Halstead created a number of measurements which he claimed were natural to the computing ecosystem, natural to the von Neumann architecture and the instructions that fed into that architecture. He measured programs by the number of operands in them, the length, the total number of instructions in any given program, and even the volume of a program. And in this case, the volume was in fact a product, like a real volume is. But in this case, it was length versus the number of operands. Halstead's ideas and his methodologies survives in certain aspects of performance modeling. In particular, it's used in high-performance computing, where the performance of a system depends upon the number of operands in a code, and also on the number of operands that are complex, that require multiple clock cycles to complete. However, there were a number of shortcomings with Halstead's methods, and they are not widely used today. You can go to both the ACM and the IEEE literature and find regular references to them, but only a few per year. The shortcomings was that this approach really was neither sufficient nor necessary to produce good code. It was more focused on issues of performance rather than quality of software engineering. Second, these metrics proved to have a high variability, that one program could be coded in slightly different ways and have radically different links, radically different volumes, and radically different other measurements. As might be expected in an ecosystem that tried to model itself on the natural world, and one that could demonstrate high variability, these measures proved to have very low correlations with each other. They did not prove to be useful in predicting a wide variety of useful things and measurements. Finally, it ultimately was targeting and building a very chaotic materiality. It was measuring things that seemed to shift even within the programs themselves and within applications themselves. It was producing a measurable ecosystem But the measurements were not fixed, they were not particularly stable, and they were not particularly meaningful. The final way of looking at software, the one that connects directly to Walter Schuhart, considered software as part of a production plan. It comes out of the aerospace industry in the 1960s and 70s, which is one of the largest users of computing and computing power in the world. The aerospace industry in the United States was centered in the area just south of Los Angeles Airport and in around Long Beach. It produced the major missile systems as well as the major combat aircraft. In this environment, Barry Bohm was creating software to support missile systems. He was well versed in production and in particularly the kind of complex production and high-risk production that was being done in that area. He also grasped the connection between software and production planning, in particular because the production plans for large systems, such as the one pictured here, the Saturn V, had many detailed steps, were highly documented, and along the way had point after point that were used for testing the quality and for minimizing the risk of using the system. Because software was, in his view, part of a production plan, you could turn to Walter Schuhart to use his ideas to materialize it and to create high quality software. Schuhart worked at Bell Labs during the 1920s. He was one of the founding members of Bell Laboratories. His task was to look at production plans for Western Electric, which was the in-house manufacturing facility for AT&T. And he was asked to look at the issue of quality. In the Bell system at the time, quality meant two things. First was uniformity. One of the early presidents had a statement 
that talked about universal service, having the same service available to everyone in the United States. Second was reliability, the idea that the system would never go down. And indeed, during this period, they developed the process that had independent electricity, independent of local utilities, so that a neighborhood could lose its power, but not lose its telephone. Schuhart, in trying to understand what was the quality of a system and how you would measure it, took inspiration from a couple of things. First was from the materialization of modern physics. The physics at the time was dealing with subatomic particles, particles that were best described as probability distributions rather than as specific points. In trying to use those ideas to apply to his systems, to identify high-quality systems, he turned to the philosophers of his time. One of the philosophers that he liked to quote and clearly read much of his work was C.I. Lewis, Clarence I. Lewis. We will refer to him as Clarence Lewis to distinguish him from the theologian C.S. Lewis. Clarence Lewis was a student of Royce, and so he was interested in mathematical logic. His contributions to the field are now somewhat shuttled aside. He argued that the basic implication, A implies B, was not as we now interpret it, not A or B, but something that was stronger, something that was closer to A if and only if B. However, we remember him more as a follower of Dewey, as a pragmatist. And in his writings, he went back time and again and talking about pragmatism as a process, as a means of viewing the world and trying to come to grips with them as a material system. He wrote and pushed Schuhart to think about systems and to think about them in a way that could be materialized. Starting with Dewey, Schuhart went back to the basic definition of quality that had come from the Waterlivet armory in the 19th century. He looked at an object, and you would measure the object with go, no-go gauges. A go gauges would say, basically, it has to be at least this small to work, and a no-go gauge said is if it's smaller than this, we cannot use it. Once you define that, you're finding a range for measurements of an object, and hence your quality is no longer a vague concept. It's a series of measurements that fall in an n-dimensional parallelopiped within, basically, a box in n-dimensional space. Schuhart then took this and moved from object to process, processes that were used as a means of controlling systems. Now, in this, Schuhart said, okay, we have things we can measure, and we have to put those measurable points back to things that are causes. Because if we can't, why are we measuring at all? When you're making an object, you can directly take measurements and go back to machining operations or founding operations or other operations that control that measurement. In systems, you have to look for causes. And he identified two classes of causes. Controllable causes, things that people could move or address and uncontrollable or random causes. He drew this from the modern physics of his age and used the idea of random quantities to represent them. So he came up with, in this way, a materialistic view of looking at systems, a way of measuring them, a way of identifying which things were causes that you could address and consider scientifically, and those that you had to work at to minimize. As part of this work, he created this diagram that is now a staple of modern business, the cycle of continuous improvement. We build something, and then we operate it. And once we've operated it, we gather data. And then from that data, we respecify the system and continue round and round and round. Now, in this cycle, Schuhart recognized a fairly deep problem that he again turned to Lewis and others to help him understand. And that was a problem of causality. In a system, as compared to an object, you cannot always trace effect to cause in a clear, coherent manner. 
In Schuhart's model, you start by specifying your activity, what you want for the operations, and how you think they're going to behave. You then produce, and in the process of production, you can adjust the manufacture to get what you want. Finally, you inspect to see what you've gotten and move back into the specification. But in the process, there are several problems. What you specify may not actually always control production and that the things you measure may not be related to those specifications or necessarily to the production process. Furthermore, sometimes you can only understand how the system is working through destructive testing or through testing where you can only look at a small fraction of what you have. A great deal of the system is unknowable. And Schuhart's problem was to get this cycle of continuous improvement so that all the elements of it dealt with the same things. And that's much harder than most people give credence. Schuhart worked to understand how you did that, how you made the identification, and how you adjusted the circle to produce high-quality systems. Schuhart's solution was unquestionably pragmatic. He worked to align the controllable influences, to trace them through the system, and put together processes for trying to understand them. He put together other processes of trying to equalize the variation of the uncontrollable influences, and ultimately recognized that that was the final piece that pulled his system together. When the things that you could not control had equal influence on the outcome, then you could probably do no more in terms of getting all of your things aligned. This step is largely overlooked in the modern applications, particularly in the popular business applications. They assume an underlying materialism that is quite different from what Schuhart was trying to do. In the modern applications, you assume that there is a thing, an underlying object, in which the connections between manufacture, operation, and measurement are all fairly easy to see. In Schuhart's, that's not clear, and the circle is the process of making the connections, and that circle may not work perfectly. Hence, you know you are doing good work only when you see the variability of things you can't control get smaller and smaller. Barry Bohm saw this idea as something that could easily be transferred to software. And indeed, as I've mentioned, software to him was a subset of the production process. In that case, he is materializing the action of a system, and the system in this case is defined by software. There's more of an underlying structure, but the action of that underlying structure is harder to trace, harder to understand, harder to model. Time and again, Bohm argued that the complexity of software, the number of paths through a given set of code, made it impossible to understand all the aspects that affected the outcome that affected the running time, and that affected most of the measurements of quality. The controllable forces for him were much more general and involved how you tightened up those paths, how you simplified the architecture, how you restructured it, perhaps using the ideas of Dijkstra or others, to make it a more efficient, more accurate system. But he also argued that the uncontrollable forces were more prevalent. They were uncontrollable not because the human being couldn't control them, but it might be more unpredictable. Mistakes in coding, mistakes in understanding semantics, mistakes in not fully apprehending how an algorithm works. Now, he put together this argument and said, this is the way we start to engineer software. And he and his followers argued that this work was best done in standardization. The standardization of software engineering processes begins in 1978 and is very much an IEEE activity. ACM members, of course, have great influence over it, but ACM does not have a standardization process and hence tended to use the IEEE mechanisms 
for doing the standardization work. The first standard to help shape this process is IEEE 730, which comes out in its first draft form in 1978. It was one on quality assurance plans. Basically, how do you take that circle of Schuhart and apply it to the software development process? It began to define a material or measurable nature of software and argue that software was indeed a structure that was materializable, that could be measured, and that the measurements of that software could be connected back to the structure. The process continues throughout the 1970s and 80s, and this is a list of some of the major standards that we see in it. 829, software test documentation in 83, 830, requirement specification in 84, 1002, taxonomy for software standards, 87, that was a core one because it started pulling together a wide variety of disparate ideas into the single idea of how you standardize and measure and treat software as a material thing. 730 was redone a decade after it was originally written, and with it came two others, Measures of Dependability, which is 982, and 828, Configuration Management, which appeared in 1990. The one that finally pulled it all together was the Software Lifecycle Standard, 1071, which came out in 1991. All of these were incorporated in a bigger standard, which is called SWEBOC, Software Engineering Body of Knowledge, which incorporates these standards and others and says this is the basic way you put together quality software. And this standard is standardized not only by the IEEE, but also by the International Standards Organization. So where does this leave us? Well, first, it shows a group of very clever engineers thinking about a fairly deep problem and coming to a solution that radically changed their views of an artifact of software. Second, it shows the fairly obvious truth that practical problems do often lead to very deep questions and equally deep answers. Third, and I think more profoundly, it suggests how we need to look at software, or at least one way that we need to consider it. Software is part of the knowledge of work, the knowledge that goes between labor and actual completion of tasks. And as that, it's part of production plans, and because of that, it needs to be considered in a systemic way, as part of a larger system that modifies the environment as much as the environment modifies it. And with that, we'll call an end to the talk. This is David Allen here. Thanks for listening, and take care.